Hello and welcome. I hope you're doing well. Please get cozy as we jump right into these Bigfoot and paranormal encounters. Be sure to like, comment, and subscribe, and ding that notification bell. I post new videos every single day, and you'll be notified when they go live. Okay, let's get into it. I know there are a lot of people out there who believe that the grass man, specifically the one in Ohio, is nothing more than a different breed of Bigfoot. But I honestly don't think so. And I've had encounters with both. I also know that there are more than one kind of Bigfoot creatures out there. But I can only keep this encounter in line with my own experiences and don't want to speculate. I grew up in Ohio, in a very rural area, and it wasn't unusual for me to play in the woods or go fishing by a creek that ran all throughout the woods that surrounded my house. Even as I got older, I would be in the woods a lot and have encountered Bigfoot on more than one occasion. Most of the time, it was hardly an encounter, and it took place at night. But I know it was Bigfoot and not the grass man because the shape of them differs greatly. And Bigfoot seems benevolent to me. I know there's been a lot of reports about Bigfoot with all different colored hair or fur. But the ones I always saw had brownish red fur. And aside from making some aggressive noises and oftentimes throwing rocks if we got too close. To what they were claiming as their territory. They never attacked or approached us. I've seen them walking around in the woods and the moment they would see me and or whoever else I happened to be with, they would run away and seemed like they wanted to get as far away from us as possible. It will sound strange to a lot of people, but seeing and encountering Bigfoot was part of life and nothing that we ever got bent out of shape about. And after the first few times, we just started ignoring it as best as we could, and it gave us the same courtesy. However, what I am about to tell you about now is the grass man, and it's a creature we didn't know existed until very recently. Or at least we didn't know there was a name for it. By we... I'm referring to me and my family as we have all seen both creatures at one point or another. It started when we moved into a much bigger house. My dad got a crazy promotion at work and we were able to move into a huge house in a much more affluent area of Ohio. It was great, especially as a teenager, to be able to have so much space and room. We lived with my grandparents on and off and were in and out of rental homes my whole childhood. Once we moved into the new house, a whole new world opened for us and we never expected that an unknown and deadly creature would be what we had to worry about when it seemed like everything else was finally falling into place. The new house was situated on several acres of land, and it was surrounded by very dense woods. There weren't any neighbors in the general vicinity, and the house was on a large hill, kind of overlooking the valley and other homes below. You would have had to drive about 40 minutes to get from the bottom of the hill where the town and the other houses were to get to our house, and we loved it. We had an in-ground pool in the backyard and plenty of places for me and my dad and my brothers to go fishing whenever the mood struck us. It was isolated, but after living in such proximity to so many loud and annoying neighbors our whole lives or sharing a home with other people, it really felt like a whole new world for all of us. That is, until our new home went from being a place where we felt safe and at peace to a place of terror and never knowing what was going to happen next. My siblings and I all had our own rooms in the new house 
and mine was the only one on the first floor of the house. I took one of the back rooms that would normally serve as a den, but I liked it because it had two sliding glass doors that looked out over the side of the house and the woods, and one of the walls was covered in windows. I put blackout curtains up and blinds, and I was in my own little heaven. It was about six months after we moved in that everything started to get weird. On more than one occasion, I was woken up in the middle of the night to the sound of something banging very aggressively on the side of the house. I could hear it from where I was sleeping, but it was the side of the house that my bedroom wasn't connected to, and by the time I would get up and make my way over to the room connected to that side of the house and look out the window, the noises would stop. After about a week of that happening, I woke up one night to someone banging on my window in my bedroom. I immediately jumped up and looked out the window and screamed at the top of my lungs as I saw a set of eyes staring back at me. I fell backwards off my bed and my mom and dad came running into my room, turning all the lights on in the house on their way from their bedroom upstairs to mine. I was absolutely panicked, but when my dad pulled back the curtains again on that same exact window, there was nothing there. He went out and walked around the house with a gun, but there was also no one and nothing out there either. I personally think all the lights in the house going on and all the commotion alerted it to the fact that someone had seen it and it took off running. Obviously, it knew I had seen it, but I hadn't turned any lights on, and it probably wasn't scared of one human being. The very next day, we noticed our German shepherd was missing. I looked all around the yard and in the woods surrounding the house and eventually found her. She had been killed, and I will just leave it at that because it still makes me sad to think about it and her death had been gruesome on top of it. We buried her on our property, and that night I heard strange grunting sounds in the woods, but I didn't bother to look and see what was going on. I had developed, and still have this fear today, of an intense fear of looking out windows at night time. I know it sounds ridiculous, but maybe you've never seen strange and animalistic violent-looking eyes staring back at you when you looked out one. If that's ever happened to you, then you'll know what I'm talking about. The next day, the dog had been dug up, and we never found her body. I'm trying to put as much information as I can into this one encounter story, so bear with me as I leave out a few minor details. We all knew there was something seriously wrong with the house, or at least with something that was in the woods connected to the property. But we all chose to explain and rationalize it away. We essentially chose to ignore it. One night, I was home alone, and I wanted to go for a swim. We didn't have that many lights out on the deck or by the pool, but the pool had lights in it. So it was illuminated enough that I felt like I didn't need a flashlight. I heard an incredibly loud splash and those same grunting noises as I just described to you. And I heard it all as I was walking outside into the pool. I immediately saw a huge figure running, soaking wet from the pool into the woods. I ran over once it was gone and saw that it left wet footprints all around the pool. The footprints looked like they could have belonged to a Bigfoot, but the creature I had seen running away had black fur. I was terrified, of course, but being a teenage boy, I tried not to let it get to me and certainly didn't show it. About a week later, my two youngest siblings came running inside of the house, screaming and crying, saying that a large man had been standing and watching them from the woods. 
My father and I immediately went outside, and that was the first time we laid eyes on what we were dealing with. It was only about five foot seven, but it had to have weighed at least 300 pounds. It just stood there next to a giant tree, right at the tree line where the property met the forest, and it just stared at us. We stared back at it, not knowing what else to do. The creature pounded its chest in what seemed like a very aggressive manner and took off back into the woods. My grandparents were visiting and reported seeing the same creature staring at them from the woods while they were relaxing in the lounge chairs by the pool too. We had seen it, but we still didn't know what we were really dealing with. We were all certain that whatever it was had killed our dog, and now it was terrorizing the whole family. However, a few months went by without there being any sightings or abnormal activity, and eventually things calmed down enough that I wanted to do some night fishing. That wasn't abnormal, and so I got my things together and went off into the woods. I knew the moment I entered the woods that something was very wrong. It was too quiet and too dark. It was nighttime, yes, but it was darker than that. It seemed unnatural somehow, like there was a dark and malevolent presence that brought its own absence of light with it wherever it went. I knew that it was the creature, and I knew it was watching me. I did my best to make believe I hadn't noticed anything was amiss, and planned wholeheartedly on shooting the thing at the moment I saw it. I knew it had the capacity to kill, and I knew it was vicious and hated human beings. Don't ask me how, but I simply just knew that. This wasn't Bigfoot that we were dealing with. It was something much more sinister and much darker. I kept on walking towards the water, and as I did, I heard a very loud and terrifying cry pierce the air and echo through the woods around me. It sounded like a mix between a baby crying and a woman screaming for her life. I got the chills and looked around to see if I could spot the thing that made the noise. It blended right into the woods but I saw a set of reddish-orange eyes looking out at me from some very tall grass in between some trees. It made the mistake of blinking, and finally I spotted it. I grabbed my gun and put down all my gear prepared for a standoff with the entity or whatever it was. I was scared, don't get me wrong, but I was angrier and more upset than anything else. That thing had been terrorizing us for so long, I was ready to just get rid of it altogether. I wasn't thinking of having proof of its existence and honestly hadn't thought much past killing it. However, almost as if it knew what I was thinking, or maybe it merely recognized that I was aiming a deadly weapon at it, it stood up. It started pushing on one of the smaller trees near it, and I swear to you, that the tree started bending. It was looking right at me while I did that. Then, after it nearly snapped the whole tree in half by simply pushing on it with its weight, it started banging on some of the other trees. The banging loudly echoed all around me, but it was suddenly coming from several different places, and the horrible cries were also coming from all over the woods. It wasn't alone. I realized right then and there, there was a group or family of them, and that they would kill me in a heartbeat if I didn't get the heck out of there right away. I turned and walked as quickly as I could out of those woods, and the next day, my father and some of his friends went out there with guns, but they never could find the creatures. The harassment would go on for years, and there wasn't anything we could ever do about it either. No one believed us, except other people in town who had almost hit it when it jumped out in front of and then attacked their cars, and the local authorities didn't help at all either. Then, one day, 
It all just stopped, and we didn't have any activity for years. It starts and stops suddenly, but we never got another pet, and even now, I live very close to the big house on the hill where my parents still live. I won't have any pets, and I don't allow my children to play outside. There's a ferocious and terrible monster that lurks out there, more than one of them, and I believe that they're responsible for the death of as many animals and livestock in the area. However, upon doing further research, I believe that they are also energy vampires and feed off of terror and lower vibrational human emotions. That's just my theory, but it is based on a lot of experience. I left some stuff out of this encounter and just tried to list some of the times when we came across the so-called grass man. It isn't Bigfoot and is a whole other type of being. That's the only thing I know with absolute certainty. On to the next one. I am very excited to announce that on this channel we are offering membership. Now, I never want my subscribers to feel like I am paywalling content, so new videos will remain 100% completely free. The membership is a way for those who feel like they want to support me to do so and help the channel grow monetarily. What your membership gives you access, though, to are subscriber badges, which evolve with how long you've been a member, and you can watch your badge grow from a baby Bigfoot all the way up to a sage Bigfoot. Also, as a member, you'll get access to member-only emojis, which are these beautiful Bigfoot emojis. Again, I never want to paywall any content on this channel. I always want the content to be free because I love the community and I want you to enjoy your time here. But if you do wish to support me making this content, this membership is a way for you to do that. Thanks for listening and on to the next one. At Lemon Creek near Nelson in British Columbia, Mr. John Bringsill, a woodsman and hunter, was picking huckleberries when he suddenly saw a seven to nine foot tall Bigfoot with four inch long gray blue hair covering its body, walking slowly towards him. The creature seemed curious and when it got to within 40 feet of John, he sprinted for his car and drove away. On to the next one. Between Quinell and Prince George, just off the Caribou Highway in British Columbia in Canada, Mrs. Calhoun was waiting in a small creek, waiting for her daughter to return with her lunch. While waiting, she heard a noise that she at first thought was her daughter and turned to speak to her. She saw the half-human, half-animal eyes of a strange creature that was observing her. She picked up her hunting rifle to protect herself from this creature that appeared human with very long arms. It had small black eyes and blonde brown hair on its chest and long, loose, matted hair on its head. The creature had high cheekbones, a wide, flat nose, a sloping forehead, and a mouth that stuck out. The creature made no noise or sound, though it moved its lips, and then it jumped into the brush and disappeared. On to the next one. I'm a musician from Daytona Beach, Florida. Four or five years ago, my band was recording in Vancouver, B.C. On a few days off, we were invited to go on a camping trip to this place by Port Alberni. However, it is a provincial park and well-known by lots of people. It's about 15 minutes out of town. Let me start by saying it was my first camping trip ever, and we went with a guy we met named Simon. He claimed to be a woodsman, and, by the way, he could climb a tree, I don't doubt him. It was me, my wife, a bandmate named Matt, and his wife, and Simon. We got to our campsite and could not find the guy who sold firewood, so Simon got some little sticks together and made a little fire 
and the girls went to town in Port Alberni to get some girl things. I said I would stay and look after the fire when they went and brought some firewood to keep the fire going. I was running around picking up what I could find, and there was a branch that was kind of broken off this tree, so I was pulling on it trying to break it off, but it just wouldn't break off, and when I turned around to sort of pull on it, I saw a bear in the bushes. I didn't want to make eye contact with it, so I turned around and started pulling with my back facing the bear. Then I became more than a little worried, because I don't know how bears are with people. When I turned around to see what it was doing, I thought it was maybe a simple person, maybe camping with their family. I said something like, hello, or hey you, being nice. I made eye contact for two to three seconds, and it stood right up and walked away. It was walking on two feet and was more broad than it was tall. It also carried its hands much different than a person would. I don't know how to explain it, but it was weird. It didn't scare me at all, and I thought it was weird. The one thing I remember the most is after it took three or four steps, I couldn't hear it anymore. I just went back to a rented campsite and hung out till Simon and Matt got back. I was not afraid. Later, I asked Simon if there were bears around here. Everybody just started laughing at me, saying the first time I go camping, I think I see bears, blah, blah, blah. I never even told my wife the truth. Weird, huh? The one I trusted most. So, that's what I have to say. I've seen bears before, and I've gotten pretty close, and they just seem to pay no attention to humans. Like I say, I play in a band and do not like the outdoors, fishing, hunting, camping, any of that stuff. But that's what happened to me. Although this was his first camping trip, the witness had seen bears as he was driving along the highway before, and this creature was definitely not a bear. When the witness turned around to see what the creature was doing, he thought it was a human with Down syndrome that was crouching behind some bushes, so he tried to talk to it. The creature then stood up, and he looked in its eyes for three to four seconds, then it walked away. When the creature was standing and facing the witness, its arms were by its side, and the palms of the hand were facing the witness, unlike a human with a similar posture with stand. The creature's palms had black skin on them. It had a flat face and nose with a big forehead. Only the chin stuck out a little. The facial skin was black in color. It had hair on its cheeks, but not over the eyes or mouth. The eyes were dark, but they were similar to a human. He could see the sclera, the white part of the eye. There were no visible ears on the creature. The witness was surprised how large the torso of the creature was. It had a massive chest. It had a short neck, but when the creature was walking away, the witness could not see the neck. It was approximately six feet tall, and the witness estimates it weighed a minimum of 350 pounds. It had hair that looked black. It was shiny and well-groomed, two and a half to three inches in length. The witness mentioned the head had a pointy type thing. There was no odor present during the encounter. When the creature walked away from the witness, its body was leaning forward at an angle when it walked. He could not see the neck at this time because of this. If a human had walked at this angle, they would have fallen forward. He also stated that during the encounter, he felt no fear. He was more relieved that it was not a bear. He was surprised by how quietly the creature moved away from him through the bushes. It took three to four steps, and then he couldn't hear it anymore. He returned to the campsite and later asked his friends about bears being in the area. They laughed at him, so he didn't tell them about what he saw at the time. The sighting location was in a rainforest near a river. The river is a major salmon spawning area and is a popular salmon fishing spot. There are many types of wildlife in the area, such as deer, squirrel, bird, rabbit, cougar, and bear. On to the next one. At Goose Point near Anaheim Lake in British Columbia, Mr. Harry Squinnis was preparing for bed when his tent flap opened and a hairy monkey face with human eyes peered at him. Harry snatched up a light 
which did not work, so he ran outside and threw some petrol onto the campfire. In the light produced, he saw four ape-like creatures lying down about fourteen feet away, as if trying to hide. They all then jumped up and walked off into the darkness. Harry yelled out to them, but they appeared to ignore him. There were no footprints, but there was one huge lone handprint up on a tree trunk. On to the next one. At Pitt Lake in Westminster County in British Columbia, 25 miles northeast from Vancouver, two brothers working as prospectors for mining companies were at an elevation of 4,000 feet. There was deep snow everywhere, though it was a sunny day. At noon, they were hiking into a valley when they found tremendous footprint that led to a small frozen stream. A short while later, and further on, they saw a nine to ten foot tall hairy humanoid. The creature was covered in auburn hair. The arms were longer than a human's and hung below the knees. The hands were huge, like yellow canoe paddles. The creature just stood there, transferring its weight from one foot to the other as its hands went back and forth. The witness sketched the Bigfoot before it walked off. It was very ho-hum. On to the next one. I visited Spokane, Washington. On a sales trip in the summer, I was then, as I am now, employed by a major electronics distribution firm that had a number of clients and prospects in the region. This was a four-day trip, which, depending on the client, typically involves a little whining and dining, as well as other activities. A fair amount of my clients are younger, and game for just about anything. I have hiked, skied, and fished with more than a few of them, but on this particular day, I had no takers, so I was braving the Quartz Mountain Lookout Trail alone. I was told that there were some fantastic views of the surrounding area once you reach the fire lookout station. Now, as I begin, I must tell you that this isn't called Quartz Mountain for nothing. In fact, the mountain is predominantly made up of quartz. In the world of the paranormal, quartz and limestone are said to be the engines for weird and strange occurrences. I mention this now because what I'm about to unveil to you and your listeners is very strange indeed. I began my day's hike up to the fire tower. There are actually a number of trails that you can take up the mountain, all of which vary on the level of difficulty. Relatively speaking, the first three quarters of the hike was uneventful. It was on the last quarter, where the trail started to tighten up and becomes closely flanked by hanging branches and trees. Once I had made it to the top, I climbed up into the fire tower to have a look around and eat a bite of food. And from that point, four lakes were visible, sprawling across the surrounding area. I knew all their names. Spirit, Hosser, Newman and Liberty. I was checking out the lay of the land with my binoculars when my eyes locked onto something white moving around on a grassy field far below me. It was too far to tell for certain, but it appeared to be a small girl wearing a white dress with no shoes on. She was frolicking in this field just like any other small child would. I watched her spin and run around the field for almost 20 minutes, and I kept saying to myself that at any moment, someone would surely come into the field to get her. I mean, she couldn't be out there alone, unless, of course, she had somehow gotten lost. Finally, my fatherly instincts kicked in, and I decided that I had to go down and try to locate her. What if she were really lost? She could die out here, and nobody would know. I couldn't walk away from here without knowing she was okay. 
I estimated the distance between us and figured out which trail was the most direct before I departed from the fire station heading in her direction. Once I entered the trails, I could no longer keep an eye on her. It was a blind hike downhill, and I could only hope that I was heading in the right direction. A strong sense of urgency had welled up within me about this little girl, and I was going down the slope at a frantic pace, hoping that the forest would break open, revealing the field as quickly as possible. After about 30 minutes, the forest gave way, and I entered a field. Immediately, I started to look in every direction, searching for the small child, but I didn't see her anywhere. I thought that maybe I had found the wrong field. I was about to continue onward when I heard what sounded like a little girl singing, but it was very faint. Frantically, I started to look around in every direction, when suddenly, standing far out in the field, was the little girl. I couldn't understand it. I had just looked in that same direction and saw nothing. There was nothing in this field to hide behind, yet there she was, dancing around as though she had been standing there all along. She couldn't have just run out there in a matter of seconds. For a moment, I could only stand where I was and question my own sanity. After a long moment, I yelled, Little girl, are you lost? She didn't respond at all. She just kept skipping and dancing and singing. I shouted again, taking care to raise my voice. Hey there, little girl, are you all right? Suddenly, she stopped dancing and just stood with her back to me. My hair is actually standing up as I'm telling you this, because what happens next is out of this world. That little girl, wearing a white flowing dress and no shoes, was maybe 80 to 100 yards away from me. And she suddenly started to transform before my very eyes. The dress seemed to melt away from her as she grew and began to turn dark. I wanted to run, but I was frozen where I stood. There, right where the girl had been standing, Mere seconds ago was a monster. I grabbed the sides of my head and fell to the ground. I thought that I must have had a stroke, and I was going to die out here, delusional and alone. All I could do was lie there in the grass, holding my head and trying to sort out the pieces of what was happening. After a time, I rolled onto my side and sat up. Once again, my eyes fell upon that monster as it walked away. It crossed the length of the field before disappearing into the trees. Even when it was gone, I remained where I was. Even now, I'm unsure how long I sat there, not being able to come to grips with what I had just seen. At some point, I managed to get my feet back under me, and I made my way back to my car. That afternoon... I walked into a doctor's office. I wasn't sure of what I was going to say, but I had to make sure that I was okay. I was eventually called in, and the doctor asked me what he could help me with. I spun my yarn quickly, and with a great deal of personal shame. He told me that the mind can do funny things, and then he asked me if I had been working long hours and traveled a lot. He must have thought I was off my rocker, popping some pills, and frankly, I couldn't blame him. Who would believe my story? The doctor wrote me a prescription for something to help me sleep, telling me to follow up with my regular doctor when I got back home. To this day, I cannot shake the events of that afternoon. It haunts me like a reoccurring nightmare. On to the next one. This happened back in the 1970s, up in Northern Maryland, near the Pennsylvania border. My late husband and I lived in a community that backed up against a large swath of forest. This forest was large and extended for miles in length and width. If I were to guess, 
I'd say it was about 300 acres back then. It's now been chopped up and developed. At this time, my husband was a Maryland state trooper and was working the third shift, which put him on the road from late evening until the early morning. I hated when he worked these shifts, but such is the life of a trooper's wife. For a couple of weeks, I had smelled a pungent odor out behind our house during the hours my husband was gone. I mentioned it to him, and he said it was more than likely a skunk. He was an avid hunter, so I took him at his word. Our living room faced the backyard, and in the living room, we had a large picture window. Our couch was just below it, and it's where I sat to sew while I watched television. Almost nightly, the odor came around. At first, I ignored it. Then I began to turn on the light in the back to see if I could see the skunk and shoo it away, of course, praying it didn't spray at the same time. Each time, I never saw a thing, although I do recall one hearing something in the woods making some noise through the dry leaves. I thought nothing of this, as we often got critters like deer and fox coming around. The particular night in question, I was sitting watching a show on PBS. I recall this because each detail of what happened next is seared into my memory. The smell returned, but something was different. I felt as if I was being watched. I felt that sensation before in my life, but now it was intense. I lifted my head from what I was sewing and looked at the television. The hairs on the back of my head rose, and I just knew there was something just behind me. I instantly became afraid and didn't know what to do. On the end table next to me was our phone. I thought about picking it up and calling my husband via dispatch, but I thought that was premature as I was only having a feeling. I wanted to look back, but I just feared that there would be something there, so I stayed frozen. I can't tell you how long this went on, but it seemed like forever. I kept going back and forth, debating myself until I found the courage to look over my shoulder. When I craned my head back, I immediately recoiled. As I was looking into someone's face, Although this wasn't a person, it was something else. I yelped and jumped from the couch, dropping my needle and thread. I rushed away from the couch, almost tripping over the coffee table. Whatever it was in the window, it followed my movements with its eyes, then pulled away from the window, disappearing into the darkness. I immediately ran to the back door, turned on the light, and looked out through the glass in the door to see something large and dark running across the backyard towards the woods. I checked to make sure the door was locked and went to the phone on the wall in the kitchen and dialed the barrack dispatch. I told them I needed to reach my husband and that I had an intruder at our house. After I got off the phone, I rushed to our bedroom closet and got a shotgun. I can still feel how scared I was. My hands were trembling and I couldn't quite get the face out of my mind. My husband arrived at the house in about 10 minutes. He raced inside the house, his revolver drawn, and went immediately towards the back door. I told him I thought whoever or whatever it was was gone. He unlocked and threw open the door and exited, his revolver in one hand and a big mag light in the other. He walked around the yard and to the edge of the woods. The pungent odor was still lingering though it was faint. He went to the spot at the window and made out some large impressions in the mulch. He walked the perimeter of the house numerous times before coming back in. I described what I saw, and he dismissed the idea. How I described it then is such. The head was large, very large, and the face was wide, with wide-set eyes, about six inches or so separating them. The nose was flat, sort of like an ape, and the face had hair on it, though it wasn't completely covered. Its eyes were round and black, and that's what scared me the most was its eyes 
and how they tracked me when I jumped. The thing didn't appear scared, but did snap back after a bit and took off running. For many years, I kept trying to convince myself that what I saw was a man wearing a mask, but I can't deny it anymore. What came to my window was a Sasquatch. I don't know why, but for some reason it was drawn to our house. I do wonder if it kept coming because I was alone. My husband was able to change ships because of what happened, and whatever it was never returned. Any time I sit down now, I make sure my back is never to a window, or if it is, I make sure the blind or drape are drawn. I never want to ever look back and see a face staring back at me again. On to the next one. In 1994, I had purchased a copy of former President Theodore Roosevelt's book, The Wilderness Hunter. Within the book is a detailed account of a Mr. Bauman, who in his youth was a trapper, and he had quite an experience with a Bigfoot, with his partner, which he apparently had shared with Mr. Roosevelt. This book was originally published in 1893, and I would highly recommend it to anyone who is an enthusiast of the outdoors, and in particular, Bigfoot. For those of your listeners who are of the mindset that everyone is lying about Bigfoot, I don't believe it will make a difference. The same being true of what I'm about to share with you. Suffice to say that Mr. Roosevelt was so stirred by what Mr. Bowman had to say and more than likely knew him to be a man of great character, that he placed his account between the covers of his own book. According to the account, Bowman and his partner were trapping in the mountains which divided the Salmon River from the head of the Wisdom River when the encounter had begun. Now, I'm not about to recount Bowman's story to you. You can read it for yourself. What I'm going to do is tell you about what I did as well as what I found after reading the book. After spending years of my own life doing the very things which Roosevelt and Bauman had done, and having never seen a Bigfoot, I decided if these creatures had lived there, then they would be living there now, as do the bears and everything else, unless they had died off as a species. It was my opinion that they would be there, and I could find them if I did my due diligence and I would. As Roosevelt recounted Bellman's testimonial about what had occurred regarding the Bigfoot, the events surrounding it were multifaceted, with many things having occurred both in and around their campsite and the area in which they were trapping. I had decided that I would reproduce as many aspects of his own account that I could. For three years in a row, I spent two weeks at a time in this very same area. Although I wasn't trapping, I had been baiting with fresh fish from the rivers and with apples which I had brought along on each occasion. Having begun this quest in 1996, it was in 1999 that the evidence began to unfold. Truth be told, I am glad that I am alive to tell about it. Had I known then what I do now, I would have never gone there, especially on my own. I should also mention that in each of the previous two years, I hadn't heard nor seen anything that I would attribute to being a Bigfoot in any way, shape, or form. In 99, I had once again made my way into the area and had constructed a lean-to as Thalman and his partner did. The only difference was that I had a small yellow mountaineering tent as well. It was on my third night, as I was sitting by the campfire, that I began to hear some loud crackling and thrashing around in the timber, which surrounded me, and it was coming from two different directions. The volume and ferocity of the noises which I was hearing were such as I had never heard before in all my days hunting in the wilderness, and it was certainly nothing that I would attribute to the behavior of a grizzly. At one point, I turned my light into the woods, in the direction of the noise, and saw nothing. 
The presence of the light seemed to silence the activity. I sat by the fire with my rifle the entire night. In the morning, I awoke, having apparently fallen asleep at some point, and I began to search the surrounding woods for evidence of what I had heard that night. I found numerous areas, both to the north and south of my encampment, where large limbs had been snapped from trees and strewn about the forest floor, with the freshest of the breaks being more than evident. That day, leading up to the night, I had caught three salmon. I strung two of them high off the ground in the boughs of two pines. I had also made a nest of pine boughs, which I laid on the ground outside of my camp, in which I had placed five apples. It was about 2 a.m. that night, while, once again, sitting by the fire, that a hideous stench began to envelop my campsite, and yet I heard nothing, not even a peep. In the morning, having arisen from my sleep, and after eating a good breakfast, I went to survey the site where I had placed the bait during the night. The fish, as well as the apples, were gone. Both salmon had been taken down, including the twine which held them, and all five of the apples were removed from the nest. During the day, I had once again gone down by the river in the hopes of catching a few more salmon. I had been gone for several hours until I caught more salmon, and then I returned to the camp, only to see upon entering that my lean-to had been torn apart, the same thing having happened to Bauman in Roosevelt's account. The logs and boughs from which I had constructed it were thrown around the entire area, in what I can only say was an act of violence on the part of whatever had done it. Some of the logs had been thrown 75 feet or more outside of the encampment, with all of this having been done during a beautiful day while I was away fishing. That night, I had decided not to place the enticements out, as I had the previous night. In hindsight, this proved to be a near-fatal mistake on my part. Truth be told, I should have hightailed it out of the area that morning, but curiosity had gotten the best of me, and I stayed. It was close to midnight when the branch cracking had begun, having first heard it in the location where the salmon had been hung the night before, and then in the place where the apples had been placed. I was now convinced that the creatures had returned for their spoils and were not happy. Suddenly, I began to hear loud grunting coming from several directions, followed by large branches and rotten logs being hurled into my camp, with one of the logs landing directly into my fire pit, sending embers flying in all directions. This was followed by what sounded like a frenzy of activity, of limbs breaking and bushes rustling like a war party had been started around me. I stood to my feet with my rifle in hand, circling in one direction and then another, expecting an attack at any time. Suddenly, a roar as such could not be imagined erupted in the woods next to me. So loud was the roar and so intense that I thought it would literally tear the clothes from my body. It hurt my ears and my flesh was quivering, as it went on and on for some twenty seconds or so. As the roar abated, the woods became deathly silent, with not so much as a crunch being heard by me, and I stood my ground. I realized that I had relieved myself in my pants, a fact that I was unaware of until the roar had stopped, and I heard nothing more until the sun began to rise. No footsteps, no breaking branches, nothing. It was all over. As soon as I could see, I put together my bedroll and packed the tent, exiting the area as fast and as carefully as I could. Although I had not set eyes on a Bigfoot, suffice to say I had proven, at the very least in my own mind, that these things are real, and they are not to be trifled with, by anyone or anything. I don't know how I avoided being killed that night in the woods, which I am convinced they easily could have done had that been their intent. If you ask me, Bigfoot is real. My answer is emphatically yes. On to the next one. My name is Cora, and this story happened when I was just a kid, maybe about eight. 
I had a friend named Karen who was about three years older than me, and she was always getting me in trouble until after this event. That is, then I quit hanging out with her. Well, Karen and I had all kinds of adventures, though most were related to the cow pie ambushes we were famous for. We lived on the edge of town, and there was a cow pasture next to my house, so that's where we got our ammo. Our cow pie ambushes were famous, and I think kids came from other parts of the little town we lived in just to see if they would be ambushed, though our primary territory was the trail to the swimming hole. Our aim was pretty accurate, and we eventually even set up our cow pie protection program for kids who wanted to come through the neighborhood and go swimming and not get ambushed. The protection fee was usually in the form of candy. If the mafia had been in our little Oregon town, we would have been early candidates for membership. I mentioned this to show you what brats we were, or at least that's what my older sister called us. At the very least, we were pretty fearless and acted like little banshees most of the time. Our fearlessness is what led to this really strange event I'm going to tell you about. One day, after sitting in the ambush for a while with no victims, we got bored and decided to go explore some new territory. So we went to my house and made some bologna sandwiches, grabbed some cookies and sodas, and headed down the trail to the swimming hole, which was just a place where the creek had cut away at the bank enough that it made a big bend and slowed down and pooled a little. We had no interest in swimming. It was just a handy starting place for whatever adventures we could come up with for the day. We would sit and eat our lunch there and figure out what to do next. As we sat there, Karen decided we should go visit this distant hill where she'd seen what looked like an old building of some kind. Of course, distant to a kid of that age isn't the same as distant would be to an adult. So, that hill was probably really only about a quarter or half a mile away, but to us, it was a long trek because it was unknown territory and we had to cut through some of the thick woods to get there. We talked about what the odds of getting lost would be and decided to use a radio tower on an even more distant hill as a landmark. We sat there like we were getting ready to explore the darks of the Amazon or something. That was part of the adventure, talking about it and building it all up. We finally finished our lunches and started through the wood. We'd done this sort of thing before, and I'm sure if our parents had known, they would have had a fit. But they thought we were at each other's houses, reading the Hardy Boys or whatever clueless parents think their kids do. We had set our course pretty carefully, and we gradually got closer to the hill with this old building on it, and finally, with a few new scratches to show for our effort, we were there. It wasn't much, just someone's old house that was crumbling into the dirt, long abandoned, the road all overgrown with weeds. A few irises had managed to survive and spread into a small field. It was really pretty, all these deep blue irises everywhere. Karen picked one for her mom and stuck it behind her ear. So we looked around a bit, kind of disappointed that our adventure hadn't amounted to much when Karen decided to climb a big tree behind what was left of the house and see if she could see anything of interest and maybe salvage the day. As she sat up there, pretty high by my estimation, maybe 10 feet or so, which is pretty high to an 8-year-old kid, she started making weird noises like a chicken. I couldn't figure out what she was doing, but I finally gathered that she wanted me to climb up there with her and look at something that had either really excited or really scared her. I managed to scoop myself up the tree until I was beside her, and that what I saw what had riled her all up, and why she didn't want to call out to me. Not far from where we'd been messing around by the house was an old maroon pickup, and there were two guys standing by it talking. We couldn't hear what they were saying, but one of them was holding a shovel in one hand and something big and kind of whitish in the other. It looked like a bone, though we weren't close enough to really tell much, but it had the shape of a big leg bone, like that of a cow or a horse or something. They look really shady, Karen informed me. I wondered how she could see well enough to tell that, 
but I usually deferred to her judgment, she being the older and I presumed wiser. Why shady, I asked. They're digging up something bad, she replied. Let's get closer and see what it is. Maybe we can get some kind of reward or something. Reward for what? For turning them in for digging up something bad, she replied with irritation at my apparent slowness. They're probably crooks, and we can turn them in and get the reward. I suddenly lost interest in this new adventure. I had no desire to tangle with crooks, and I told her this, but she ignored me. I was soon obediently following her as she crept closer to the two men. I was amazed at how gutsy she was, but followed along right up to some shrubs that couldn't have been more than twenty feet from the pair. We crouched there, silently eavesdropping. Look, Henry, this is something that we should probably report, don't you think? The speaker was a short, stout man who looked to be in his thirties. The other man was taller and older, maybe in his forties. Both were unkempt and looked pretty questionable, even to someone of my tender age. The breeze shifted, and the smell of alcohol was strong enough that it made me want to retreat. Hobos, I whispered to Karen, and she poked me pretty hard in the ribs which quieted me right down. Of course, real hobos didn't have vehicles, but I didn't know that at the time. Shane, you're a fool and an idiot, said the second and older man. What I'm holding right here is our ticket to our own rags to Richard's story. How so? Shane asked. This is a woolly mammoth bone, you fool. We'll excavate the whole skeleton and sell it to some collector for millions of dollars. Millions of dollars? Who'd pay that for a bunch of old bones? Lots of rich people would, you dummy. They collect stuff like this, fossils and dinosaur bones, and all kinds of old things. Build their own private museums to show it off. It's kind of like you collect these stupid baseball cards. Same idea, but more expensive. We'll come back tomorrow with more tools. Karen whispered to me, There's no such thing as Willy Mammoths here. It's a mastodon. I didn't argue, my ribs still being sore from the last time she poked them. Now the pair put the big bone in the back of the pickup, after wrapping it in an old blanket that looked like it had more holes than blanket. They took off the truck, winding through the tall weed. Karen stood up after they were gone and immediately headed for where they'd been. She looked around, me following, then took off in the direction they had come from, given the beat-down weed. I was beginning to get a real creepy feeling, though I didn't know why. I didn't want to talk, so I tugged on her shirt until she stopped. I said, I'm going home. This place feels creepy. All Karen did was make another noise that sounded even more like a chicken. I knew what it meant this time. It meant chicken. She continued on. I was afraid to go forward, but I guessed I was more afraid to go back alone because I kept following. We walked through the tall weeds into a clearing, and it was soon apparent where the men had dug up the bones. We stood by the edge of the hole where I observed another large bone sticking out. From the look on her face, I knew Karen was also aware of it. The bone was huge, and it was obvious that it was part of a ribcage, but I knew it wasn't even close to being big enough to be a mastodon. But it definitely wasn't human. I thought it was the right shape. It was just too big. We stood there, then... I felt even more creepy. For some reason, I was beginning to feel that someone was watching us. Suddenly, I heard a loud moan, like someone really large would make. I turned and ran like the wind. I didn't care if Karen thought I was a chicken. I would rather be a live chicken than a dead hero. I ran as fast as I could, and I could hear Karen right behind me. I didn't stop at the old house but ran all the way back to the swimming hole where I stopped only long enough to ease the burning in my side. And then I ran again, all the way to my house. Karen was right on my heels. We collapsed in my room and I closed the window. I just couldn't get rid of that creepy feeling. I'd never felt anything like it, not even when I'd watched a forbidden R-rated horror movie Karen brought over while my parents were gone. We just sat there, breathless, then, finally, Karen said she was going home before it got dark. It was only about two in the afternoon, but I was kind of happy to have her leave. 
though I didn't feel scared about her walking home alone. I just wanted to forget the whole thing. I didn't understand it. I couldn't sleep at all that night, and I imagined something big and dark walking around outside the house. I thought I was dreaming until I heard something bump into the siding right where my bed was. I jumped up and went into my parents' bedroom and climbed into bed next to my mom. She was surprised, as I hadn't slept with her since I was a toddler, but when she realized I was crying with fear, she let me stay. She kept telling me it was only a dream, but I knew better. The next day, I went and spent the day at my Auntie Wilma's while my parents were at work. No way I was hanging around home alone, and no way did I want to see Karen. I was afraid she would want to go back out to the old house. I was still scared to death, and I had no idea why, but my instincts were telling me something was wrong. That night, I could once again hear something big circling the house. I snuck into my parents' room again, this time waking them up and whispering for them to listen. They could hear it, and I know they were scared too. My dad didn't have a gun or anything, and after a while he called the police. By the time they got there, it was gone. We were all awake by then, and my dad asked me what was going on, so I told him. I told all about the house and the men with the bone and finding the ribcage and how big it was and everything. I told him about how something was watching us and how spooked I'd been and how I ran and ran and how the thing had bumped the wall where my bed was. I talked so fast, I'm not sure they even caught it all. My parents had no idea what to do, so we all just sat around and talked until we were too sleepy to talk anymore. Then we all just kind of fell asleep right there in the living room. My dad was in a big easy chair and me and my mom were on the couch. The doors were locked and the curtains closed so we felt pretty okay at that point, except I woke up with a sore neck. I hadn't heard a peep from Karen and then that next day she called me. It was highly unusual for her not to come over all day every day. Something weird going on, Cora. Something's been stalking all around our house at night and making weird sounds. I told her we were having the same problem, and I knew it had something to do with the bone. She paused for a long time. I was expecting her to argue with me as usual, but this time she didn't. What do you think it is? Maybe it's a mastodon ghost. I expected her to laugh, but she didn't. Like in that weird movie I brought over? Yeah, except that was a human ghost, not a mastodon. Well, duh, she replied sarcastically. We need an exorcist. Right, a mastodon exorcist. This isn't funny, Pipsqueak. It was your idea to go over there, not mine, I replied. You always follow me around like a little puppy. You didn't have to go. I could feel our friendship faltering. It had been on a shaky foundation for some time. What she was saying was true enough, but... There was an element there that I had somehow mistaken for authority and leadership. Be careful out there, Karen, I said with an air of finality, knowing she planned to go back to the old house. She was oblivious to what I was trying to tell her, or else she just didn't want to hear it. I'm going back there. Are you going with me, or are you going to stay home like a little chicken? Stay home like a chicken, I replied. I can conduct ambushes fine on my own, she threatened. Fine by me, I answered, then hung up. I had never stood up to her before, but fear can motivate one in strange ways. There was no way I was ever going back out there, and I figured she wouldn't go without me. That night, Karen called me back. She sounded truly terrified. Cora, I'm here alone. My mom's working tonight at the hospital, and dad's out of town. Mom doesn't want me here alone. Can I come over? Please, I'm sorry about this afternoon. My mom went and got her. When they arrived, Karen looked terrible. My mom made us some hot chocolate, and we went back into my room. I actually felt better with her there, as I wouldn't be alone. We tried to watch something on TV, but neither of us was very interested. So we turned it off, got into our jammies, and crawled into bed, turned out the lights, and talked. I could hear my mom and dad still up talking about something in the living room, and it was comforting, even though it sounded a bit like an argument. Karen started telling me about this thing that had terrorized her house. 
and had both her and her mom scared to death, and how they'd called the police who had come and found big footprints all over their yard. We talked and talked until it was late. Then we both finally gave in to our sleep deprivation and went to sleep, curled up with the covers over our head. That night was quiet, with no strange noises. That morning, while we were eating breakfast, Dad had the radio on listening to the news when the announcement came. Two homeless men had been found dead at the old Blaine place, and it appeared they'd been digging up the old Pioneer graveyard out there. After the police investigation, the county had sent in a backhoe to push the dirt back onto the graves and cover everything back up. There was no mention of the odd size of the bones, nor how the men were murdered, except the announcer had said that the death had not occurred under mysterious circumstances and appeared to have possibly been from some kind of wild animal attack. Karen and I just looked at each other. And if the thought of going back there to check it all out crossed either of our minds, it didn't stay there long. After that, Karen pretty much stopped coming over I guess she found someone else to string along, or maybe it was because seeing me reminded her of how scared she had been. I don't know, but soon I had a boyfriend to hang out with, even though he was younger, only seven, but we never had another visit from whatever had slammed the side of the house. We eventually moved away, and I lost track of Karen, but I bet, like me, she never forgot that day out in the Bigfoot graveyard. I hope you enjoyed those encounters, and if you did, be sure to hit that like button, leave a comment, and subscribe. I post new content every single day, so be sure to hit that notification bell, and you'll be notified exactly when that new content arrives on my channel. Again, thank you so much, and until next time, bye!